All right, life continues, moves on, but uh, it's, it's good to be here, so good to be back at Shalom, and uh, we, we got to figure, I guess it was, what would you say, baby, 2018, since we were here last, and, uh, and so it's, uh, time moves on, and uh, time, time flies when you're having fun, or time's fun when you're having flies, like the frog said, but anyway, it's good to be here. Let's go to Romans chapter number 6 this morning. The book of Romans chapter number 6. Romans chapter number 6. I appreciate the Lord. He sure have been better to me than I deserve. And if we're honest, we all could say that. We all should say that. There's a couple of you, I know. You definitely should say that, John. I mean, uh, anyway. That's right. <laughs> Romans chapter 6 this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and uh, ask Him for His help. Sunday school hour and, and today. And uh, I, I've discovered along the way, and the Lord keeps reminding me, He doesn't have to have me, but I sure have to have Him. And uh, so let's seek His help this morning. Father, in Jesus' name, we come to You this morning grateful for Your blessings, grateful for the opportunity to be in the house of the Lord this morning. And Father, we thank You for the privilege. We thank You uh, for the reason that we're able to gather together and the reason of Jesus Christ. And Lord, thank You for our redemption. Thank You for salvation that's so rich and so free. Lord, thank You for the Bible that we have to open this morning. We look to its pages for, to find strength. Lord, find comfort, find grace. And, and Lord, You meet our needs. And Lord, You've been so good to us. Lord, I pray that You'd help us today. Father, we stand in need of You. I can't teach or preach without the power of the Holy Spirit of God. So Father, I pray that You not let me try this morning. Lord, you just control everything said, done today, whether it's preaching, singing, testifying, offering, Lord, everything, announcements, Lord, everything takes place today would be in accordance with your will, and you'd find honor and glory in what we do today. Lord, would you be pleased? I pray if there's anybody here that walks through these doors, that steps onto this property, Father, that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, I pray that today would be the day they come to Jesus for salvation. Lord, we love you, and I pray that you change our lives today through the Spirit of God and through the Scriptures, and we'll love you and we'll thank you. These things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's look at Romans chapter 6, verse number 11 this morning. The Bible says in verse number 11, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you're not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. The book of Romans, this chapter, Romans chapter 6, is absolutely chock full of just powerful preaching on the Christian life and how we ought to live our lives as believers, Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm glad that the first step in our life is becoming a Christian. The first step is accepting Christ, but that is far from the last step. There's so many steps. Believing in Jesus Christ is step number one, but after that it's a journey. And it's a lifetime until we are in the presence of God. There's so much that God has for our lives today. And uh, look at this. This chapter starts out asking a very interesting question. Verse number 1 asks how we continue in sin that grace may abound. God forbid. And it's a question that he asks. And asking us if we should continue in sin because of grace. 
I'm thankful for the grace of God. There's a lot of things that the grace of God does in our lives, but there's a lot of things that it does not do. Paul addresses some of that. He, he spends a lot of time. He just spent uh, the early parts of the book of Romans uh, dealing with things. In Romans chapter 5, he reminds us of the past of grace. In Romans chapter 5, verse number 12, he reminds us of our former condition. He says in verse number 12, Wherefore by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for the all have sinned. He reminds us of our former condition. I'm afraid a lot of times uh, we forget where we came from. Now we shouldn't live in the past. But I believe there's some times we forget where God brought us from. And I believe it would do us good sometimes to remember where God brought us from. Because it reminds us, hey, we're, uh, now we're not all that in a bag of beans. I mean, God, God has brought us many times from an awful, awful past. But all, every one of us, if we're saved, He brought us from a life of sin that ended in destruction. No matter how, what level, varying degrees of sin... God brought us out of, He brought us out of a life of sin. He reminds us of a life of judgment, a life of sin, a life that ends in death because of that sin. Sometimes we need to remember, listen, where God brought us from. Then He, re, he gives us not only our former condition, but then He reminds us of free redemption. In verse number 15 of Romans chapter 5, But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God. And the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. He says in verse 16, And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. It reminds us not just of our former condition. I'm glad it doesn't end there. But he tells us of free redemption. He said, just, hey, listen, just by sin came by one man, so does salvation come by one man. Judgment entered into the world by sin, justification entered by the Savior. And he tells us about that. And as we look in Romans chapter 5, there's, different, there's several different contrasts that he draws. In verse number 15, he draws the contrast of death and life. There's two ends of the spectrum there. In verse number 16 and 18, he tells us of judgment and of justification. And then in verse number 17, he tells us the difference, the contrast of being ruled by death and the contrast of being ruled in life. What is God trying to show us? What is, what is Romans chapter 5 teaching us? I believe it's simply this. I believe that Jesus is trying to tell us that He overcomes sin. He overcomes sin, no matter how great or how small it takes Jesus to overcome, to conquer sin. Uh, in verse number 20 of Romans chapter 5, he says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. I love that verse. The word abound means to be present in abundance, to increase or to grow. Listen, there's a time in our life where for sin was abounding, sin was growing, sin was present in abundance, where it was growing freely. We were controlled by those things, and it was what dictated to our lives the way we lived. But the Bible says where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. It overflowed. It exceedingly beyond measure. Listen, it doesn't matter how great sin is. Grace is greater. It doesn't matter how bad a person gets. Grace will always surpass the guilt. Salvation is so great that it comes overcomes every sin. No matter how wicked an individual is, grace can take it away. Grace is the answer to sin. And I'm glad for the grace of God this morning that has brought us from that condition of sin and judgment into justification and grace. I'm glad for the grace of God this morning. The grace of God gives me what I don't deserve. Oh, listen, the grace of God, everything beyond an eternity in hell is God's grace that He gives to us. And it's so rich. 
It's so, so free. We sing amazing grace, wonderful grace of Jesus. Oh, listen, we sing on and on, and, the, and, and, and even the songs that we sing can never fully exhaust the grace of Jesus Christ. But then he gets into Romans chapter 6. After telling us how great grace is, how grace abounds much more than sin abounds. And he says, because of this grace that is so great, how should we respond to it? What shall we say then? Because of this grace is so great, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 2, that gives us the obvious answer. God forbid. You see why grace overcomes sin. Grace does not excuse sin. Why grace conquers sin. It does not condone sin. Why grace forgives sin. Grace does not allow sin. You see, there's a balance. But so many times... We are faced with a mentality that gives us this thought process that God's grace has saved us so that we can just do whatever we want to do. It doesn't work that way. God's grace saves us so that we can have a new life and carry a new message. Look in verse number 4. Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. Listen, God gives us uh, 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 this grace so we have an opportunity to get beyond our sin, but so many times we found ourselves gripped in the very things that He has freed us from. That's why the book of Galatians reminds us, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free, and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. You study the word entangled again, it has the idea that we entangle ourselves many times with the things that, the things that God has already freed us from. How many times do we find ourselves in the same rut? Sins in our lives. Maybe it's even those sins that nobody else is aware of, but we are aware of them. They are, they are a constant struggle in our life. And it seems that even as Christians, even as believers in Christ, we, we find ourselves trapped in, in the grip of sin that we just don't seem to be able to break free from. How many times do we think, Man, I finally got victory over this area. Man, it's not two days and we're right back in the battle, right back in that trap, right back in that snare. It seems like God's having to pull us out over and over again. How do we break that grip? How do we, how do we get free as Christians? How do we get free of the things that many times hold us that sometimes seem unbreakable? It seemed to be a grip that's so strong we can't get out of. How's that possible? Let's look at a couple things this morning. Just some practical things I believe will help us from Romans chapter 6. How do we break this grip? How do we keep from living a life over and over again by the things that Christ has already freed us from? But we allow ourselves to be back in bondage too. Number 11, verse number 11, number 1 the Bible says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Number one this morning, how do we break the grip of sin in our lives? Number one, decide in our mind. Decide in our mind. The word reckon is not just a southern word, right? The word reckon means to calculate. It means to consider. It means to weigh the reasoning. To meditate or determine, to count out. It comes from the same word we get our word logic from. This idea, the Bible says in verse number 11, likewise reckon, it means to make a logical decision. It means to make a logical choice. 
based on that what God has told us, based on the fact that His grace is great in our life, that it has the power to overcome sin, because of that, I should make a logical choice to be dead indeed in the sin. I, I, I had a professor in college that used to ask this question, how are you going to live for God? Or how are you going to be faithful to your wife? How are you going to read your Bible? How are you going... And the answer was always the same. You choose to. You choose to. You see, we've all heard the statement, the devil made me do it. But the truth is, as believers in Jesus Christ, the devil doesn't make us do anything. Everything that we do is a result of our choice. And the Bible says if we're going to have victory over sin in our lives, over these hang-ups, over these uh, uh, habits in our life, we're going to have, it's going to have to start by making a choice. It's going to have to start with our mind deciding to live for God. You ever thought about how much emphasis the Word of God puts on our mind? The way we think? The Bible says in Proverbs 15 and verse 28, The heart of the righteous, the heart of the righteous studieth to answer. Mark 17, verse 21, From within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, adultery, fornications, murderers, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. From within, out of the heart, the way we think. Proverbs, uh, or Philippians 4, verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are of trust, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. He gives us a command. He gives us a criteria of how to think. Philippians 2 and verse 5, he says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. You'll know how to think. Think like the Lord Jesus Christ and we'll be all right. Isaiah 26 verse 3, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Again, putting emphasis on the way we think. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 16, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The emphasis is on the way we think, the choices that we make. If we're going to live in victory, it starts with the decision to live in victory. See, I found this along the way, that God's already given us everything we need if we'll just be obedient to Him. This decision is personal. The Bible says in verse number 11, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed in the sin. It's personal. No one will make the choice for you. I, when, when I first started getting into ministry, especially I started youth pastoring, and, and man, I had a desire for young people and, and adults alike to do right, to live right, and, and to make the right choices. And, and for a long time, it used to aggravate me to no end. And man, there'd be, there'd be this teenager in my youth group, and man, they'd, they'd come Wednesday and Sunday morning, Sunday night, and then all of a sudden you get a call that they've gone out and done some knucklehead stupid thing, and you're like, man, what in the world? world have you done? I mean, I've been in the court with some of them and on and on and on and sat with parents and tried to figure out what in the world you were thinking. And it used to bug me, Tim. It used to drive me crazy because I'd think, well, Alan, I think, well, maybe I didn't preach the right message and I'm not going through the right series and maybe there wasn't enough youth activities and events to, and, and, and maybe they just fell through the cracks somewhere until I realized one day, you know what, they make a choice just like I do. You can hear the Word of God preached every day, but if you don't make a choice, then the one that stands behind this pulpit can't do it for you. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves. It's a personal choice, but it's also a present choice. It's a present choice. Just because we choose to do right 25 years ago doesn't mean that we'll choose to do right today. It's amazing how this Christian life goes. It's a day-by-day -day thing. It's a moment-by-moment moment life. And many times we talk about, uh, uh, we, we talk about 
camp decisions. And what would mean by that? You go somewhere and, and the Lord speaks to our heart. And man, even go to the altar and get things right with the Lord. And that's good. That's a starting place. But then come Monday morning or come Tuesday morning, it's almost like those things are forgotten and we go back into our life. Listen, the Bible says in Romans 12 and verse number 2, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. That is a process. It is a daily process. It is something that happens yesterday. It happens today. It will have to take place tomorrow. These decisions that we make have to take place every single day. Paul says, I die daily. He reminds us that it's a present decision. It's something that we have to decide every single day. But this decision is also pressing. If you study it, reckon is in the imperative mood, which means it's a command. It's a command from God to decide to live for Jesus. You know what that tells me? If I'm not living for Jesus, I'm disobedient. If I'm not choosing to do what God has instructed me to do, to live the way His Word has instructed to me to live, then I'm in rebellion to my Heavenly Father. Because it's a command to be dead indeed in a sin. If you're here this morning and you're lost, you can be saved if you choose to. It's a choice. If you're here this morning as a Christian and you don't have the power of God, you can have it if you choose to. Because He gives us the choice. There is a decision to be made. But then, number two, we are to decide in our mind. But number two, dictate to our members. Look in verse number 12. The Bible says, "...let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies." that ye should abate in the lust thereof. Verse 13, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness and sin, but yield yourselves unto God and those that are alive, as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. To dictate to our members. We are to tell our members. The word reign means to rule over or to call the shots. The word yield means to place at someone's disposable disposal. Members, it refers to our individual parts. You know what God is telling us? God is telling us that how we think is how we act. See, it starts in our mind, but then it proceeds to our outward in the things that we do. Well, uh, Proverbs 23 and verse 7, the Bible says, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. We do the things that we do because we think the way that we think. And Paul says, listen, if we're going to live for God, if we're not going to continue in sin, if we're going to live a life that is victorious, we're going to live a life filled with the power of the Holy Spirit of God, then there comes a point where we have to tell our bodies, we have to make a choice, and then we have to act upon it. We have to go, we can put feet to the decision. We have to put motion to our mind. We have to go about doing what we decided to do. Yield. It is a voluntary to place at someone else's disposal. He said, whoever you yield yourselves to obey, that's your servant. Whoever you obey. Whoever you give your members, the individual parts of my life, I'm responsible to let my flesh and my body know that I don't belong to me, I belong to Him. I'm responsible to let this world know I don't belong to this world. I belong to Him. Therefore, He is who controls my members. I don't just do that in word. I do it in action. I show the world that I belong to God. What's different? I belong to Him. Why do you? I belong to Him. That's why. You know, I shouldn't allow my hands to steal things that don't belong to me because these hands belong to God. They're not mine. My flesh looks and sees something I want. And my flesh says, take it, nobody's watching. But my mind says, I belong to God. Therefore, I'm going to yield my members as instruments of righteousness unto God. You know why I shouldn't allow my feet to take me places when I should be in the house of God? Because my feet belong to God. 
And therefore, because they belong to God, I'm going to be obedient to Him and let Him control the way. I, I am yielding my members as instruments of righteousness unto God. You know why I shouldn't allow my eyes to feast on things on the internet that is not holy and, and honoring to God and pleasing to Him? You know why? Because my eyes belong to God and I should be yielding my members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul says, I let my flesh know what I'm going to do, not the other way around. We get in trouble when we don't dictate to our members, but we allow our members to dictate to us. When this flesh that we see with our eyes, when we see this flesh that we feel with, when it starts being in control is when we get ourselves back in the grip of the sin that God's already forgiven us of. That God's already given us freedom over. We put ourselves right back into that bondage. Whoever you give the control of your mind to will control your members. Lastly, number three, there is the need to decide in our mind. And number two, to dictate to our members. But number three, be dominated by our Master. Look in verse number 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you're not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are of to whom ye obey, whether sin unto death, or obedience unto righteousness. The word dominion there, it means lordship or mastery. You see, there is a truth here that whoever we yield ourselves to, that's who controls us. We, our flesh controls us many times because we give it control. Our mind goes places that it should not go because we allow it to have that control and that free reign. Listen to me. This morning from the Word of God, as we study the Word of God as believers in Christ, Satan has no authority in my life. He doesn't. He has a lot of influence sometimes, but he has no authority. He has no power. You know why? I don't belong to him unless I give him that authority. My flesh... It should be put to death daily. It should die daily. It should be placed under the subjection of Jesus Christ. But there are times in my life when I decide that whatever He has for me is not good enough or not desirable enough, and so I allow my flesh to take control instead of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And, and the Bible says that, listen, whoever I yield myself to obey, that's who I'm a servant to. We can say all day long as Christians, I'm not serving sin, but if we sin, we do. If we yield to the temptations of our flesh, that's who's in control, whether we say it or not. You know why there is a such thing called addiction? Because what we yield to will eventually control us. There comes a point in a Christian's life when you yield to the flesh, yield to Satan, yield to those desires and passions that are unholy and wholesome. You can yield to them enough by choice that eventually you yield because of control. There can come a point where you no longer are in control because of the mastery that eventually can take over. I deal with people so many times who are controlled by addictions, controlled by substances, controlled by desires. And you see it and they think, man, I, 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 can't, I can't control it. I just I don't know how. I can't break free of it. And in a very real, real way, that is the honest truth. They can't. Because in a very real way in our life, that thing, that idea has gained complete control. A year or so ago, I was there on the streets in a town where we live. 
and come running down the street comes a young man about 22 or 23 years old. His name was Stephen. And Stephen was screaming at the top of his lungs, Get them away from me. They're chasing me. Get them away. Get them away. There was nobody chasing him. Not visible anyway. What had happened that day is Stephen had got hold of some drugs and put those drugs in his body and those drugs overtook him to the point he was out of control. He had no control over what he was seeing. He had no control over what he was thinking. That substance had complete control of his body. He ran up to me and a fellow that was, that was standing there with me and he's hollering, help me, help me, somebody get them away from me. They're after me. There's nothing we could do. Nobody was chasing him. And Stephen at that point, he collapsed on the ground in the fetal position, rocking back and forth on the ground, sobbing, crying, get them away from me. Let them, get them, somebody help me. Because his entire life at that moment was controlled by what he had yielded to in the past. He was a young man, 23. You look at him, he'd obviously spent a lot of time in the gym. Very fit looking young man. Had obviously lifted weights and ran. He wasn't overeating, but because he yielded his members, he was now controlled by his master. And on and on and on it goes. Probably every single one of us in this room could give illustrations and stories of those who yielded long enough that they finally lost the ability to yield and now we're being controlled. How important is it for us to say, you know what, I'm not going to yield myself to anyone other than my Savior. I'm not going to give the control of my life. I'm not going to give the control of my mind to anybody other than the one who bled and died for me. And when I do, I get in a mess. It's the will of God that you and I be completely controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. That's His will. Anything that controls us other than His Spirit and His Scriptures is wrong even when we're in control of ourselves. How many times have we got ourselves in a mess because we decided to call the shots? Jesus says, if you yield your members as instruments of righteousness to God, you'll be alive. You'll have a... He said, I came to give life and give it more abundantly. We can't go wrong when He is in control. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 25, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Nay, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. 1 John 5, and verse 4, that He that overcome, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is He that overcometh the world? But He that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. <laughs> if, if we're going to break the cycle of sin in our life, it's going to start with a decision in our mind. It's going to start with a dictating to our members. And that leads to being dominated by our master. We will be controlled by something. We will be controlled by someone. It's our choice who we're controlled to. Who we're controlled by. So who do we give our control to? How do we get past and make a decision? God, I'm yours. This area of my life is yours. Whatever the area it is. Nobody else may even know a thing about it. But you do, and the Holy Spirit of God does. And God's here, He said, listen, I've already given you the victory. I've already won the battle over sin. I've already won the victory over Satan on the cross. We, we face a defeated foe this morning. As a Christian, you have everything that we need to live godly in Christ Jesus, First Peter tells us. But it's a matter of we're going to make that decision to follow Him and to honor Him or we're going to do our own thing. Choice is ours. Choice is mine. The choice is yours. What choice are we going to make? I don't have to live defeated. 
I'm afraid so many times we get in place in our life. We just see no way out. We just say, man, I've just been beat up by this thing so long and the devil's got me defeated so long. We're defeated because we allow the devil to defeat us. We get to the point where we just can't see a way out. We've been so involved for so long and it's, and it's had its grip on us so long. God says, no, no, my grace is still there. Where, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. It's still available if you'll make the choice to do things God's way. It's up to us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, thank You for the Word of God. Lord, thank You for... Uh, how you speak to our hearts. Thank you for how you convict us. Thank you for how you challenge us. Lord, thank you for your ability to change us this morning. Lord, as we bow before the Lord today, as we, as we allow the Holy Spirit to examine our hearts this morning, I pray, Father, that you would point out those areas that we must yield to you today. Lord, help us to give in to the conviction of the Holy Spirit and just surrender. Lord, here I am. This area of my life, whatever it is, it belongs to you now. No longer am I going to allow my flesh to make decisions. No longer am I going to allow influences outside of the Holy Word of God to make decisions in my life today. I belong completely, totally, wholly, mind, soul, and body, I belong to Jesus. And today, He is in control of every area of my life. We love you this morning. We thank you and we praise you for what you'll do for us. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.